So today we're going to be treated to a behind the scenes look at Dead Pets Unleashed in a talk about art direction from a colour perspective. So please welcome art director Inna Hansen. Firstly, a little trigger warning. I'll be showing some setup for a scene that has the themes of sexual assault, but uh, nothing will be graphic or violent or anything like that, but, and I won't be getting into it. And then there will be some cartoon uh, violence, or like blood, <laughs> and some teeth things. I'm in Hansen, I'm the art director over at Triple Topping Games in Copenhagen. I moved there for um, about three months ago, and I worked there for a little over a year remotely. Um, and I've been a freelancer for most of my career. So I've worked on art direction and uh, concept art in a lot of different projects and developed what they should feel and look like. So. This is what you get when you search for my name, I hope, on the internet. Uh, this sort of art, and this is the stuff that you don't get to see on the internet. And this is also some stuff that I do. And this is a project I'm really proud of. And this is the project I'm working on right now. And I'm, I'll get back to it in a bit. So, colors. Uh, Dead pets and colors have some overlap, and uh, I'll, I'll be getting into that in a bit. Colors aren't real. I never really understood colors until I started researching it. Um, for me, um, to become truly color indulgent, I had to uh, start researching um, the uh, color theory of things. What, col what, what makes color tick, but then, uh, I found out that I like all of the colors, but only in specific combinations. But I will not be showing you color wheels or charts of complementary colors today, I promise. Rather, I will talk to you about my color fixation regarding the relationship of color to things and our perception of them. So, I'm here to tell you, you've been lied to all of your lives, colors are not real, but that is actually super useful when you're doing game development. So, our relationship to color is kind of instinctive, but it helps to, uh, to think of it as contextual when analyzing our reactions to it. Yellow, for instance, is um, uh, very nice in a fruit, but then in, in the white of a person's eye, it can look sickly. Uh, a bright red dress is a very nice um, outfit, but put it on the walls and ceilings of your home office and it becomes glaring. So the thing that the color is on matters a lot. But the color itself is not a thing, though. It's a phenomenon that happens on multiple levels of reality. It doesn't really exist as an object's property. It is closer to being a concept like idealism or success. It's a sensation, like taste or smell. So when the lights are off, things don't actually have a color. You cannot feel it with your fingertips or touch it um, or, or taste it with your tongue or even measure it with any man-made instrument. So we like to think of color as a property to a thing, like the ball is red, but actually this assumed red ball is only red when certain criteria are met. The lights have to be on. The person looking at the ball has to not be colorblind or visu visually impaired. The light uh, has to be a neutral one, and only then is the ball in fact red. The true color of things for us humans is the one we see when um, there is pure and white daylight. Our brains have a system to eliminate um, the chromatic bias of the ever-changing light uh, that happens throughout the day. It's pretty cool stuff, actually. And um, our brain was doing exactly that of the great internet feud of 2015. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So was the bodycon dress blue and with black lace or white with gold lace? If you saw it as white, it meant uh, that your brain was attributing the blue color to the indirect bounce light. If you, uh, if you saw it as blue, you were thinking that the dress itself was blue rather than the light. So I saw it as both, uh, but uh, the white one was when it was sunny outside and the, the blue one in the evening time. I have no idea exactly what it means, but it has to do with the confusion of the chromatic bias that we all experienced. So the owner revealed that the dress was actually blue with black lace. But the objective color of this dress is blue and orange. If you take a look at that uh, picture there, it's it's quite orange, like if you analyze it and uh, extract it from the image. <laughs> um, okay, so, in conclusion, colors aren't real. Um, but in order to understand why all of this matters, and to put it in some context, I'll talk to you about some functions of colors. So. This is kind of how to use all of this nonsense uh, to, uh, to make games. So, color's identity, it means uh, recognizability through color palette. This one is based on association of things and colors together. So, this is how we can create uh, meaningful color uh, palettes for our IPs. And color is a stor storytelling device you can use color to support the narrative. This is a very complex one, and it's super useful for pro progression. Then you have color as categorization. That is color coding. We do this a lot in games, um, for adding categories for things, for showing different levels, for showing how dangerous something is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of these functions overlap. You can have categorization, telling a story, or having the color identity affect the way that we uh, uh, color categorize stuff. And I will get back to this uh, several times throughout this talk. So this is the game I'm working on right now, um, over at uh, Triple Topping in uh, Copenhagen. And uh, it's called uh, Dead Pets Unleashed. And allegedly, it has colors. It's a narrative game about feminism and punk music, a, a being a demon, and maybe even finally growing up. We follow a hyper-relatable uh, main character, Gordy, as she goes through life doing demon stuff and uh, trying to get her band uh, to succeed. Let's have a little uh, look at the trailer to get the impression of what this game is about.
So um, we have a demo out already, so you can get it on Steam. Uh, it's free. And uh, we've got two episodes uh, in there right now. All right, so back to identity and uh, the first of our functions. Um, it's, powerful, it's a powerful way of making people immediately recognize your brand, and it's a good way to create coherent art direction for your IP. Um, I'd like to show you some examples of uh, IPs that do this really, really well. Um, I really like to use this one, uh, because you can instantly see that this is The Simpsons. Um, and The Simpsons are, um, did a very... Um, interesting choice of making all of the faces really bright yellow, um, which is also relatable to Legos. Uh, but then only with the proportions of the characters and, uh, and their colors, you can instantly see who they are. Uh, you can probably also see it in the next lineup here. It's pretty clear that this, this is the South Park characters, and I think that's quite fascinating how, how our brains immediately recognize this. Firewatch lan landscape is super iconic and very easy to spot, and I, I've seen a lot of people trying to imi uh, imitate this uh, kind of style. Uh, and Limbo has a lack of colors, um, and this hadn't been done like a huge uh, amount of times when it came out. And together with these uh, blurry backgrounds and the crisp, uh, sharp black uh, foregrounds, it's really striking and immediately recognizable. The Matrix is all green, uh, and I use it as reference a lot for, for our game as well. Uh, to, um, it's, it's just such a strong choice, to, um, and you can see the, uh, from any of the screenshots through any of the movies that this belongs to the Matrix universe, just by looking at the color. Here's another one. It's, it's striking. So. Back to Dead Pets and its uh, IP identity. So the original concept was, the, uh, was made by Marie Somerwolf. Um, and it went through so many iterations before landing on the thing that we have today. Uh, both in, in terms of um, the art direction, but also conceptually. So we needed to find a, uh, like a, a vision for the art direction. So when I came onto the, uh, the, onto the project, a, a lot of things had already been established. But we wanted to push the art direction further. And so uh, we set some benchmarks or some goals for the art style. We wanted to uh, have the theme of nightlife, demons, and maybe even encompass some like feminist undertones somehow. And um, but I wanted to grab uh, the essence of something that was already there, namely the color palette, because I thought it was pretty cool. So, making a mood board based on the stuff that was uh, already in, in the game, I boiled it down to its color elements, and instantly found some associations to uh, Dream Pop, Synthwave, and Sailor Moon. Pastel demons were a pretty catchy idea, but it was hard to understand that it was a demonic world by just one glance. And so I pushed it towards darker values, making the neons pop. And that pal uh, palette, it evoked more of the like nightlife setting, which matches the showbiz or like music uh, business setup. So following that theme, I wanted to experiment with some color light effects, and this is a step-by-step -step showing how that was done. Uh, this is like a quick uh, Photoshop experiment kind of thing with layers uh, added to it. In, in this setup, I discovered that I really wanted the characters to stand out a little bit more, adding lights and shadows to them as well. That meant going away from the flat, um, flat color uh, identity or style, and uh, towards a more lit one. So here you can see the same street before and after. A lot of things have happened in, in the art direction since. Uh, this is like a year in between uh, the first design and the, and the last one. But mainly the most striking thing about it is the light and color. Uh, even though the, the lines have not changed, uh, all of the other things have. 
So um, remember how that dress was confusing to a lot of people, how you didn't really know which of the colors to choose, where that's chromatic bias at play, that's the thing that happens in our brain. So when you're making sprites, you're making a local color for things. Um, and in different lighting co conditions, that color will change. And most of the time, we're actually not confused about it at all. It's a, it's a very uh, a solid system in our brains. So we know what the color is supposed to be. So you can get away with quite a lot of tinting and stuff. Uh, this is a, an example of an original design for, uh, uh, for a set of sprites versus the updated version. So it didn't really change that many colors there. But what happened was um, um, the, the top one here is pretty much unlit. There is no light and shadow. There is just local color. And the second one on, on the bottom it is lit, there, it is darker, so that the lights pop out, and it becomes more uh, atmospheric uh, and has like this dark edge to it. Here's another example. This is the original uh, room of the main character, Gordy, and it's bright and energetic, and it has its own thing going on. But matching it to our current uh, art style, it becomes like more edgy and dark. So we kept like the lots and lots of details, but uh, made the light and color work in a different way. So now that we have that color identity, uh, we want to use it across the entire game so that you can kind of uh, see that all of these things co come from the same place. Here's the changing dress up mini game interaction kind of thing where you get to choose a gorgeous outfit for the day. Here is the world map. Uh, and it has like a variation of the same theme of colors. Here is a rhythm game that we have, which is a peppier version of them. Here is a vibrator cleaning uh, thing that you have to do daily to make Gori happy. <laughs> and, and this is a. <laughs> catch a tampon on stage when it all goes wrong um, in, a, in a concert that uh, they do. It's a one-off game. Okay, so now that we have this identity, how are we going to make it? So this is kind of how we implemented it. So we decided on having the volumetric lights that are glowy at all times and influ influence all of the things in the room. We have uh, the local color palette should be acidy with some like neutrals going on to it, and we wanted like this heavy like moisture density in the air uh, going on um, with volumetric light and shadow. All of these elements belong in a dreamy, trippy nightlife kind of setting. So the way we did it was uh, first to add uh, these volumetric lights. And there's a ton of way of doing it uh, in uh, a lot of techniques for this. But uh, the way we did it was to recreate the hard light layer mode in Photoshop in, uh, into Unity. Uh, because hard lights, you can light things, but you can also make things darker and tint uh, the darker areas uh, of your objects. And then we have this. Uh, character light map. So the characters get this masked onto them, um, and it's only applied to them. This is the way it looks when I'm testing it. Uh, so this is like a hard light uh, layer mode in, in Photoshop. And uh, this is the way it looks in the game. And notice how it's um, this unlit character over here, she's very different from even when she's not in the light. She, she goes very dark and blue when she's in the shadows. So all of these colors change, even though that we picked these local colors for her. So in real life, if you want to add volume or shape to your light, um, you have to put some particles into the air, because uh, light cannot um, have a shape unless it's bouncing off of something. And so 
uh, when they make this in live action movies and stuff, they will uh, put a lot of moisture in the air and then cast a, a light beam through it. And that effect is kind of uh, what we wanted to emulate in our game as well. And so we made this uh, grainy noise uh, filter thing uh, to add to the life and like the, the movement of the light. All right, we made it back to the functions. So um, we have some nice uh, direction to the colors, and now we want to use what we know about perception for sto storytelling purposes. So you can change the mood through color, you can show the importance of something through color, you can build associations through it, there's a lot of stuff that you can do, and um, perception matters the most here. It is how the colors feel to a player. In animation, they use this technique a lot where they will meticulously create a color script for, uh, for the movies. This is from Finding Nemo, where, um, yeah, you can kind of see the emotional progression of the movie throughout that. And they also did that. Um, sort of thing in Journey. So uh, this is from Journey, and they planned out the, uh, the dis descent and ascension of the character in the game um, by planning it out in color. And it's super effective and a very cool thing to follow through on. So colors are all in your head. And it is because they are an experience. And it uh, has uh, way less to do with fact than it does with imagination and assumption. It is something we can learn. So um, this, by the way, totally relates to, to the narrative thing. So bear with me here. Uh, the moon shines red. So most people would describe the moon beams, like the moonlight, as uh, pale and blue. And uh, most movie directors will push this effect, and I, I've seen this in games as well, where you, you will push um, the moonlight to look like it's really, really blue. But it's actually red. Like, if you measure uh, what kind of um, uh, light beams are co coming off that, it will be red, because the, the sun is shining onto the moon, and that bounces back um, to the Earth, and what we see is just so low in light that we don't really see any color and we assume it to be blue. So for us, the moon feels like it's uh, shining blue on us. And the sun is black, for some. Um, a depressed person actually struggles with per perceiving color. The eye will pick up the light waves as normal, but you don't interpret them in the same way. So what happens in your brain is different. And after a devastating earthquake in Armenia, Spitak area, in 1988, um, a mass of children had been evacuated uh, and really traumatized after the events. And in the time after, they, they were put into therapy and also art therapy, uh, where they were observed drawing a lot of black suns. It's a really ominous uh, thing. And when they were given other colors to work with, like they would, would take away the black and give them other colors to work with, they would refuse to draw. They would be like, this is not the way I see the world. Um, and, but over time, when, um, when they healed, they returned to using color. So in Dead Pets, in the much heavier part of the story, the protagonist finds herself in a very si a shitty situation. Uh, and she finds it hard to deal with it. So it's portrayed in, a, in monochromatic hues. It's blue, it's, it sets a somber tone, and it's her personal perception of what is going on in the sin. So uh, this is just a sketch, but uh, this is a mini game we're working on uh, right now, which is... Um, where she has a conversation with a friend to tell her about the events uh, of last night. And uh, she 
when she imagines uh, what's actually happening, she can't quite deal with it, so she puts her own spin on it, avoiding uh, the painful reality. She um, paints it in rainbow colors. Her parents don't understand her that well, and so we wanted uh, the parents' house to be more like beige and less of her colors. And it was actually even more beige than this. Uh, to begin with, but then it didn't really fit into the world. We don't really have a lot of beige uh, anywhere else. Uh, but it's, uh, it's supposed to be a contrast to her colors. So whenever she's there, she feels very uncomfortable. We also do um, make the mini games a little bit brighter to make them more like peppy and, uh, and add to like, the playfulness of the thing. Especially when she plays her bass, it's uh, all of her life problems are, are not as dire and uh, horrible. So that's uh, that's how we do narrative uh, colors uh, in the game. But then we have color as categorization, and this one is really really useful and used a lot in games in the form of uh, color coding. You probably recognize this sort of uh, technique where you would uh, categorize the rarity of items. It is so common that is, uh, um, I've seen examples of it for over 20 years across genres. It's just very worthy of repetition. So our game is a narrative game. Um, and the way we handle uh, categorization is uh, uh, for narrative purposes. So we gave all of the characters their own uh, color so that you could recognize them better in um, other art styles that we have going on in the game. So in our game, we have um, a thing that we call comic scenes. They're like cutscenes, but uh, drawn in a very simple way, like very simplistic. And we wanted all of the characters to be recognizable uh, instantly, so that you're not wondering who, who you're looking at in that uh, particular cutscene. So uh, this is Gordy as really tiny, and you can still see that it's her. This is her drawn in a completely different shorthand. This is her from behind, peeing on a flower. And this is her with all of her skin melted off her face. This is her uncle, and you can see the, re the relation through the coloring on him. His teeth were st stolen by a monkey demon. It's a very sad story. Um, okay, so we talked about uh, all of the functions. And now I'd like to tell you some other color facts. So uh, our character Gordy, she's purple. I'd like to convince you of that. She's not actually purple. She's got a lot of colors going on, but, um, but she's purple-ish. But the color purple isn't real. Uh, it's um, represented on the color wheel uh, by the, these two uh, lower uh, colors right here. But uh, colors don't actually come in a wheel. They come in a spectrum like that. So uh, what we're doing in our brains is that we're combining the red light waves with the wi violet uh, light waves on the other side, and we're making it up in our brain. We're going, oh, this is purple. So I'm so sorry, you couldn't trust me. I had told you I wasn't going to show you any color wheels, but here we are. OK, so uh, Shrek. Shrek is green, and uh, this matters a lot uh, to me personally. And um, this is also my favorite color. Um, so green was also the color of Heinz Easy Squirt Ketchup, which was discontinued in 2006. Uh, the initial release made uh, Heinz uh, sales skyrocket. It was a huge success. Uh, and they, all of the kids just loved Shrek, and they wanted to have this exciting new green, gross ketchup. 
And it was an unusual color for a ketchup, but uh, it's still a usual color for tomatoes. So later on, they figured, why don't we do this again? How about purple ketchup or blue ketchup? And what happened there is that they asked uh, children, like, what's your favorite color? And the children said, blue, purple. And when they released this, um, the parents thought it looked like toxic waste and didn't want to buy it at all. And it was the biggest flop in uh, Heinz's history. It's a bizarre thing to want to buy for a child. I, I totally see that. Um, so, making the, that ketchup green was a really cool gimmick for Heinz, but it was an even better gimmick for Shrek and a very successful identity for him. So, in conclusion, colors are not real, but very important. And uh, they're not consistent or reliable. And, but when you observe how it affects people and how they react to them, it can actually be super useful in the way that we make art. And the more I learn about the subject, the more I get inspired to use colors in different ways. This is our game. If you want it, uh, if you want to go get, join our uh, Discord uh, server, uh, you can do that. You can also find it, uh, find links on there for our um, um, Steam page, and go get that demo. And these are some of the books that I've read on color. Um, they're all great. Go check them out. And uh, these are all the wrong colors for all of my social media stuff. Thank you. <laughs>